Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to today's event, China, Ecological, Civilization and Green Economy, Vision for 2021 and Beyond. My name is Juliet Tunstall. I'm the External Events Officer for the International Institute for Environment and Development. And today's event is co-hosted by IIED and the Green Economy Coalition and is part of the IIED Debates um, series. If you haven't joined an IIED Debates event, uh, the series aims to bring together an international community to discuss key and current sustainable development issues. So with that, I'm really pleased to hand over to Oliver Greenfield, who's the convener of the Green Economy Coalition and our moderator for today's session. Oliver, over to you. Hello, thank you very much, Juliette. Hello, everybody. Very warm welcome from the Green Economy Coalition and IIED. Thank you for hosting us. We have a super panel and we have perhaps one of the most important sustainable development questions in the world, China. China matters, whether or not it's uh, your interest in geopolitics, human rights, climate and biodiversity, or more broadly that sense of the shift to green and fair economies, China matters. Uh, we all remember in 2015, when we were struggling with climate negotiations with China, the US supported by the EU got that deal across the, across the line. We know that they had glimpsed that it was no longer a battle between climate action and economic development. You could have both. You could. They had seen the potential of green economy. And we know that in that transition, much of the early brave money on green economy thinking was Chinese. Um, not an economic transition that starts perhaps in the US and EU, as we have traditionally seen, but with China money. Um, so. We know that this year, 2021, there is a climate summit, there is a biodiversity summit, a, a moment when we take the global pulse of that broader green economic transition. And we know that what's China gonna do? Where is China gonna go? Um, what, what about US? How does it connect to US? How does it connect to the European Union? Um, but China also matters to the Green Economy Coalition for another reason. One of the reasons that the Green Economy Coalition exists is because we think that the wisdom of science should inform economic governance. And the, rather, we should overcome what Mark Carney described as the tragedy of horizons, where short termism dominates our economic governance and thinking. And China has five year plans. China raises its eyes above a short termism. And for, for, the, for those of us, like me, who don't know a lot about China, one assumes that they are being informed by science. They're being informed by a longer term perspective. They're starting to get a sense of the Chinese miracle it isn't just a miracle, it's just common sense. Look, look ahead, look what's coming, understand the science, understand the trends, start to put some market correction in place, line up the finance, do some sectoral thinking, support and unleash entrepreneurship and get a good outcome. Now that's all the things that we start to see and we see the amount of money going into green economy, a third of all renewable jobs, Chinese, very difficult for the GEC to work out how much Chinese money is in play, but we know trillions and it was certainly the early brave money. So a lot of positive things. And then we look at things like the Belt and Road Initiative, which extraordinary levels of carbon embedded in all of that. I don't know whether it should be called I don't know how or why it's called the Belt and Road Initiative. Perhaps somebody will tell me other China experts, but it feels more like a great carbon road. And we still have coal-powered power stations, which is extraordinary. And then along comes last year's China commitment to neutrality and carbon peak by 2030. And very confused. Generally, the GC very confused. Do we challenge? Do we support? Do we engage? What do we do? And so we reached out to Lila, Lila Buckley from IID, China expert. And she said, calm down, everyone. Seek first to understand China. Seek first to understand where China is coming from. Seek first to understand where, what China has already achieved. And um, on that part of the story, I hand over to Lila who has taken us on the journey of understanding and produced a fabulous report, which I commend to you today, our um, China's Ecological Civilization, a Pathway to Green Economy, question mark. Lila, 
Thank you. Over to you. Thank you, Oliver, and thank you, everyone, for joining. It's a pleasure to be here and to discuss this paper and, and this these reflections. Um, as Oliver has shared, the starting point for this work was really a desire to understand the evolution of eco-civilization and the concept and what it could tell us about China's approach to transitioning towards a greener economy. And this feels particularly important in this moment, this environmental super year of 2021, um, you know, when the global community is coming together to make some really important decisions on biodiversity and climate for the next decade and beyond. So in discussions with Oliver and others in the Green Economy Coalition, it became clear that understanding this was really a critical starting point for the global community to be able to engage more effectively. And in this discussion and in the paper, there were very much aimed at an international green economy audience. So those of you in the audience who are China scholars may find a lot of what I say somewhat familiar. Uh, but perhaps the discussion will help you, as it has helped me, to situate the China context within this broader set of concerns um, of the global push for a green economy and the, the, the discussions that are happening at the international level. So there's a lot of detail in the paper on the history, the political purposes, and recent trajectory for, of ecological civilization. And unfortunately, I don't have time to go into this in detail here. I have 10 minutes. Um, but just so that we're on the same page, let us answer the question, what is eco ecological civilization? So broadly, it's a concept that emerged in China in the 1980s, but that since 2016, which is really my focus in this paper, um, has been at the center of the Chinese government's new economic strategy which focuses on inclusive development and ecological upgrading for China's dream of national rejuvenation. In practice, eco ecological civilization is many things. It's a top level strategic socioeconomic goal of the Chinese government. It's a vision of sustainable development with specifically Chinese characteristics. It's a reappraisal of political governance and party institutions within China. And it's an appeal to traditional Chinese philosophical values through environmental action. And as Oliver uh, noted, it's according to some external observers, also China's answer to the green economy concept. And I think in this, it's, there's a natural ten, ten, temptation tendency to put ecological civilization side by side with green new deals, green economy, green growth narratives. But it's important to keep in mind that, that ecological civilization is, is distinct from these kinds of policy packages. It's, it's much closer to a higher level messaging concept of green growth and green economy than it is a green deal package of, of specific policies. For President Xi and the Communist Party of China, ecological civilization brings the centralization of authority, good governance, and the rule of law into rhetorical alignment. And that is alignment with the popular vision of protecting nature, as well as promoting familiar concepts that do align with green economy priorities of innovation, green technology, and dig digitalization. As a concept, it's framed in terms of ecological rejuvenation. And as such, it has established new priorities for the modernization of China and the Chinese economy, and really has been the driving force for sweeping reforms to the underlying structures of Chinese economic governance. And this was an important point that emerged through discussion with uh, the Green Economy Coalition team of realizing that it's really important to make the distinction of the Chinese concept of modernization which unlike in many other localities is not synonymous with westernization. Instead, Chinese modernization is very much about a, a destined and natural return in a sense to its rightful past eminence through rapid sociocultural change. And this process of modernization 
has been especially dominant since the 1980s, but it's also been an essential part of Chinese nationhood, as well as Chinese personal identity stretching back at least for the past 200 years since the century of humiliation by foreign powers in the 19th century. This guiding vision of eco ecological civilization then is not merely a technical approach, but a structural, social, and cultural reshaping of Chinese governance. And as such, it can be seen as tied closely with Xi's wider vision of modernization that it trickles through every layer of society. And therefore, if we want to understand the role of ecological civilization in Chinese reform, we need to understand that in shaping China's return to an ascendant middle role in world affairs, she requires from the concept a combination of old values of civilization and nature along with an impetus for modern digital infrastructure and technocratic policy, all within the rubric of a stronger and more centralized party governance. So with that basic understanding, and again, there's more detail in the paper, but um, with that broad overview of the complexity of what ecological civilization is, we then might ask, so what? What does this Chinese governance reform mean for the, a global transition to a green economy? It's really been an open question as to whether ecological civilization could be or would be um, internationalized as a model through, for example, the Belt and Road Initiative, which um, maybe in the later exchange, Oliver, we can get into some of the questions you raised related to that. Um, and, but also other international processes or through China's policy, policy leadership. There's, there's been a lot of speculation as to whether China was wanting to internationalize this concept, whether it was China's branding of green economy. And a surprising finding that emerged from this paper was some evidence of a de-emphasis on ecological civilization in 2020. The concept was less central than before in policy documents analyzed, and it was not leaned on in the announcements that came out about carbon peaking and at zero targets in last fall. And although the upcoming uh, CBD COP is running under the theme of ecological civilization, input into preparations for that meeting and also the climate COPs COP has focused much more on a broader sustainable development discourse, which is what we saw more of in the last couple of decades, um, as well as technical approaches like ecological redlining. So we don't know if ecological civilization framing has peaked. Uh, recent discourse analysis that came out last week by Sinicism shows that propaganda on many fronts important to the Communist Party really declined last year in the context of the COVID crisis. So it could also just be that it got sort of sucked up in um, discussions and policy focus on how to move forward within that context. But it, it could also reflect uh, general opaqueness in Chinese government preparations for the super year processes in general. Um, and I would suggest that the 14th five-year plan, which is due to come out in the coming weeks, is a spa space to watch for either the use of or the absence of ecological civilization concepts. But what's clear in terms of whether China is serious about a green economy domestically and globally is that the governance reform driven by ecological civilization has tangibly strengthened China's environment and economic reform. And policy commitments have continued to flow even if ecological civilization messaging has waned. We've observed unilateral action even before the US election. And there's some optimism about coming from the early drafting of the upcoming 14th five-year plan. In closing, my reflection is that eco-civilization this year is much more the Central Communist Party's domestic communication tool for the economic greening agenda within China than it is a competing international frame being promoted around the world or even an implementation approach like ecological redlining potentially will be that could be scaled up and duplicated around China, I mean, outside of China. I think our panel will have more to add to this perspective as we turn to them now to hear their main takeaways from the paper as well as reflections on 
what we can expect from ecological civilization and green economy agendas in this super year, as well as in the upcoming 14th five-year plan. Back over to you, Oliver. Thank you, Lila. Thank you very much. And uh, I strongly commend this report to you. It's, it's, it's spurred in me a very great interest in China. I've now become a, uh, an amateur historian on Chinese history. So um, fascinating China itself. And, and to that, let's bring in Sam Deal, Active Chief Executive of China Dialogue, and also from uh, working with China House. Sam, long-term expert on China, really a, a sense of what you picked up from life, by this paper, what resonates with you, where we see this going. Thank you, um, and thanks, Lila. That, um, yeah, it's a really great paper. I would commend it to uh, people to, to better understand the ecological civilization concept and why it matters. I guess it's a, it's a helpful paper because, as I think Oliver sort of introduced as well, it helps us to ask the right questions. Um, and you know we we don't really know where we're going unless we start asking the right questions. That means not just asking questions about what you know what are Chinese China's policies on on greening, but asking why questions. You know what are the drivers? What's underlying this? Well, you know what what's what's the vision here and what's the potential sort of future that it's mapping out? Um, and the things I took away, um, you know, I think Lila has touched on some of them. Uh, you know. The, probably the first one to you know to slightly reiterate is that ecological civilization you know it's not a policy program um, it's not really a green economy or a green deal type program it's a political vision and it's one broadly aimed at a domestic audience and it's one that therefore should be understood in terms of you know hard political themes um, stability legitimacy of the Chinese Communist Party security including ecological security um, and it has some key features which you wouldn't necessarily identify unless you sort of use that as the starting point. So a focus on the, the concept of red lines, the, the idea of the ecological red lines, I think is central. Um, that's, uh, you know, partly an issue about spatial planning um, and that links to the Convention on Biological Diversity, um, which, you know, we can come back to, but the, you know, China, of course, is hosting the CBD COP15 later this year, we assume, um, date unclear. Um, and, you know, one of the key uh, parts of, uh, one of the key sort of things about that CBD COP15 is that it has ecological civilization in the title. And, you know, that means something in terms of China's aspiration to what's sometimes called discourse power. That is the so-called right to speak on the world stage, to, to have its own, um, signature leadership concepts recognized by the international community and having ecological civilization in the title of a UN conference is no small thing for, for uh, Xi Jinping and for, for the Communist Party um, and links to some of the sort of drivers that uh, Lila mentions like this, this aspiration towards national rejuvenation um, and to no longer see I think there's an important point in there that, that ecology is kind of no longer seen as part of a kind of Western imperialist agenda to um, uh, dictate the terms of China's development, but is actually seen as part of China sort of realizing its own um, uh, national rejuvenation on the, uh, on the world stage. Um, there's a link, of course, to the good governance agenda, but also specifically the anti-corruption agenda um, and, and a sort of uh, linkage made. You know, in, in my um, study of the uh, eco-civilization agenda, what, one of the things I sort of noticed and, and, and thought that was a real turning point um, is, you know, I've been interested in the term since around 2007 and, and from, I guess, 2007 to 2015 or so, it was a very broad, discursive kind of term that was used for quite a lot of critical voices, um, for example, to raise uh, concerns about the sort of gap between rural and, and urban in China, for example, or to um, or to make a sort of critique of, of Western forms of capitalism. Then around 2015, I think it, it sort of shifts when it becomes very much not only a kind of core state policy linked to quite a top down policy agenda, but very specifically to specific sets of governance reforms. Some of the main ones being around trying to remove structural misalignments uh, around the way that policy is made, specifically between central and local. So for a long time, there was a big concern that uh, particularly GDP, um, sort of a, a, a focus on GDP as the key benchmark of political evaluation 
was meaning that that local officials were kind of much keener to uh, pursue growth at all cost policies um, to the detriment of, of kind of um, central edicts on environmental protection, particularly energy intensity goals, carbon intensity goals, and so on, the kinds of things that come out of the five-year plans. Um, and the eco-civilization agenda around sort of 2015 on gets linked to this effort to try and uh, change those key performance indicators. Um, so I think that's, that's one of the major points. Um, otherwise, uh, I guess the, the other key point that I took away from Lila's paper is that the way we're moving in different sort of phases uh, from a, what, what she calls a startup phase um, through the 13th five-year plan that we're just ending now, where you see ecological civilization as part of the plan for the first time, kind of underpinning some of that governance reform agenda to a kind of consolidation. And now I would say a linkage to the, the overarching 2060 carbon neutrality goal. Um, and you know we'll probably come back to that in the discussion and sort of sub, uh, subsequent questions and so on. But the 2060 carbon neutrality goal, it is really big. I think it's a really significant goal. It, it, it changes the way that we think about uh, China's future carbon emissions trajectory. I think it's real. I think it. Um, I, I think it, it was really significant because it was a unilateral goal that came out of um, uh, Xi Jinping's you know pronouncements on the world stage. It's linked to that kind of big discourse power kind of goal as a result. Um, it is really significant in terms of the way that it's changing policy making um, at the uh, Ministry of Ecological Environment level and so on. Um, and I think it's a huge market signal to, uh, to suggest that, you know, by mid-century, China's energy production has to be entirely electrified and all of that electricity needs to come from uh, non-fossil sources is, uh, is a, you know, it requires an enormous um, uh, sort of green economic shift. And, and I think uh, we're going to see that playing out sort of and aligning with the um, uh, eco-civilization agenda. So there's lots there and lots more I could have said, but um, we can uh, uh, keep the conversation going. Thank you, Sam. Thank you very much indeed. So let's come to Andy Norton, the director of IIED. Andy is the only, uh, a bit like me, the, the, the two people on this panel that aren't China experts, but experts on the sustainable development what are your key takeaways from uh, Lila's paper? Thanks very much, Oliver, and huge thanks um, to Lila in particular for the paper, which I thought was incredibly uh, clear and helpful, um, and also to Sam for those really interesting kind of introductory remarks. So my takeaways, um, I think the first one is what the paper ends with, um, which might seem somewhat basic, but just emphasizing that for external actors, uh, trying to impose an external framing and set of concepts in working with China on the green transformation agenda, um, doing that in a crude way is a route to failure and that it's critical to understand if you're interested in the geopolitics of green transformation, you need some sense of what the internal drivers of these changes are within China. And the paper is really fascinating on that, very much recommend it to people to look at if you haven't already. Um, Sam covered the link to governance in ecological civilization, which I guess came across as um, a really strong point for me. Um, and that this is a high level, a very high level political concept with links to these broader priorities around stability, legitimacy and security. Um, but also important to be aware that that nests within um, a broad, obviously, a culture of governance that broadly um, you know, has top, very strong top-down authoritarian elements. Um, I loved the part of the paper which talked about the kind of internal, external interface and ecological civilization, um, how um, the Chinese government has used this as a way of um, legitimizing to a domestic audience um, a strong engagement in leading global environmental agendas by putting Chinese cultural values at the heart of the discourse. Um, and again, that's, that was a really useful point for me. Um, something I'm sure we'll come back to in the discussion is BRI, Button Road Initiative, um, which seems to be a weak spot in terms of, um, as far as I can tell from the paper and other sources, there is as yet no comprehensive plan for greening BRI investments. And I'd be really interested in others on the panel who follow this stuff in more detail and whether they think that is an area where we can hope to see change um, in, the coming, in the coming months and, and year. Um, 
A final, well, a final couple of thoughts. Um, I think, as Lila mentioned, in the wake of the pandemic, um, the sort of primacy of the eco-civilization framing seems to be fading a little. Um, and the emphasis is coming through now, perhaps unsurprisingly, um, is on uh, framing of tech innovation, including green technology um, and indigenous innovation and these kind of classic post-pandemic concerns of securing supply chains, shortening key supply chains and so on. Um, so that also, it was really interesting that there was a sense that it's possibly fading a little, but again, um, too early to tell if this is a long-term shift as I understand it. And just a final comment, which I think is a detail in the paper um, rather than the main theme, but seemed uh, significant to me was this theme that kind of broad popular discontent with local environmental public bads, air pollution, environmental degradation in cities in particular, um, that this emerged as a material threat to the much prized kind of stability of the system. Um, and that seemed important to me because it indicates that for all the top-down dynamics that we've seen um, strengthening in recent years, policy remains sensitive to bottom-up popular pressure, at least from some publics, maybe not from all. Um, but huge thanks really to Lila and to GC and Chris and you, Oliver, for overseeing this work. I really enjoyed the paper. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andy. So. Um... We've we've got a, a strong report giving us a sense of understanding of eco civilization, where it's coming from, its historic and internal context, external context. But I come now to Yunnan Chen from ODI. Um, Yunnan, your particular expertise, um, development and public finance, China. Um, really, we know that in the COVID recovery, some of the a lot of the debt is now owned by China. We you know lots of things about green recovery, but this is a big year, 2021, the biodiversity in Kunming, everybody's eyes are on that. Uh, Eco-civilization is there, as Sam has already described. We also know that um, we've got the climate meeting um, a few years on from Paris. Have we had enough progress? Where's China? The commitments for carbon neutrality, extraordinary um caught us all well maybe not you but caught the rest of us unexpected so this is a big year but what what does this all mean as far as eco civilization green economy in china from your perspective um thanks so much oliver for for having me um uh, to this event and 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 thank you lila uh this is a really really enjoyed reading the paper and i also took a lot away from it um just speaking on the sort of international frontiers of, of what this all means, I, I think, you know, something that that other commenters and that picked up from the paper already, there's, there's really a desire for legitimacy. Uh, and that's a constant theme that runs throughout, you know, this, this eco civilization narrative domestically, but also what China is doing on the international front. Um, we've seen in the last decade, uh, increasingly assertive global actor with very strong aspirations to, to participate in global governance. Um, in the wake of the COVID pandemic, vaccine diplomacy and addressing the impacts of the pandemic is, has been another frontier of this, but also the climate agenda and, and participating meaningfully uh, in, in dealing with climate change. Um, this is a, a very prominent platform for China now to to really assert itself on the world stage as a as a provider of global public goods and as a contributor to to global governance, um, something to note also in the policy discourse is uh, you know, this idea of, of a shared community of common destiny, uh, which is very very uh, recurrent right now um, and and enforces this idea of you know China as uh, as as a as a contributor to to um, to these, this this global system um, in providing these these global public goods, and you know particularly in the in the last four years under the Trump administration, it's it's really taken advantage of that of that vacuum in leadership uh, to to push this agenda and, and to push itself as a responsible global public power. Um, I think with the with the return of uh, democratic leadership and, and the ascension of Biden. Um, 
this is a positive sign. I don't think we'll see a return to the sort of Obama era. Still a lot of remaining dis so, so in the wake of, of COVID, I think we're seeing uh, a deceleration now in, in the kind of overseas engagement and development finance that's characterized a lot of the last two decades. And this investment in, in mega projects, in these kind of turnkey engineering contracts. Uh, and there's really a restructure within China's development financing system to, to pay more attention to risk in these overseas projects. And, and I think environmental and climate risk is also going to play a, a bigger part in that. Um, something that ODI has been paying attention to and, and we're about to release a, a new economic pulse that looks at uh, the uh, China's economic recovery and implications abroad. Um, what we're seeing is also that renewable energy is going to play a much bigger part in China's overseas engagement. It's been increasing as a share of projects. So, so while financing and construction in a lot of this, the, these other kinds of contracts has slowed down, renewable energy has not as a sector. And I think in future, this is an area that you know, China is, is very, very keen to develop and expand, both domestically in expanding uh, the consumption and use of renewable energy technology to fuel its domestic energy demands, but also an area in which it wants to build a competitive edge overseas. And it's, uh, We've, we've seen in, in a recent um, forum between China and Central Eastern, uh, Central and Eastern European countries that it wants to build uh, more cooperation between companies in renewable energy. Um, and it wants to expand its renewable energy investments in Eastern Europe as well. Uh, the Belt and Road is still you know, a great concern. And, and as, as you've noted, you know, the BRI is something that hasn't really featured prominently in, in these carbon neutrality pledges. There's still a kind of open question as to what the implications will be um, for, for developing countries and for Belt and Road partners. Um, I think some an interesting development to note is that you know, China is interested in working much more multilaterally on the BRI. The, uh, there was the creation last year of the multilateral center, multilateral cooperation center for development finance, or the MCDF, that was created uh, as a platform to work with you know, multilateral development banks, including uh, you know the IDB, the the EIB, the AIIB, uh, and so there there is a platform for the influence of these multilateral actors who have very you know, uh, expertise and a long established record of, of good environmental governance and safeguards to potentially influence how the BRI develops in the future. Um, and uh, I, there's more to say on this, but I'll, I'll stop there for now. Thank you, Yunnan, very much indeed. Okay, so we have a, a very large number of participants today. I just encourage you to start putting your questions in there or voting which question you like from other people because I've given everyone one go, but I will have a couple of follow-up um, questions from our expert panels as I then look to uh, bring all of your questions in. So please be active or either voting or insight. So let's um, give one sort of final round of, of questions to Sam and we'll bring Lila back in and also Andy. This, this idea of um, what gives you hope, reason for hope? Um, the US, EU, China, is there an axis of, of real economic power um, coming through on this green economic transition? Um, the other point that, Lila, I'm very clear that this is, this is more than a policy suite. It is a, a rejuvenation, a, a sense of modernization, a, an external narrative. But, you know, we have, in the West have that saying, you've got to walk the talk. And, very difficult to put forward a concept at a, at a macro level and then still create a lot of trouble with Belt and Road carbon. So, you know, the idea of the, there's still a dissonance for me, certainly, about um, a narrative and, a, and an action. Um, so, and we also do have this big year for nature. We know that the Kunming Cop, what, what, what are we going to get from that as well? So there, there are some real um, sort of macro questions for us about maybe Andy, I'll come to you on EU, US, China. Um, 
Lila, I might come to you about the question about the, the difference between um, uh, concepts and external concepts of the reality. And um, Sam, really that sort of reasons for hope for this year, what you think we were gonna get maybe from this uh, 14th year finance, um, 14, sorry, the 14th five year plan. Um, and maybe all of you might address that, what we, what we should be looking out for, because this report was really written to warm us up to give us more insight in how to evaluate the, uh, the five-year plan. So all of you can pick up that question if you wish. So let's just do a quick round, final round before we open it up. Um, Lila, I'll come to you first because you sat there patiently. Thanks, Oliver. Um, lots of great questions coming in from the audience as well. So um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the disconnect uh, between, you know, the sort of vision and um, broad narratives versus action is is one the world over. And, and I think one of the questions coming from the audience asking, you know, is China actually better equipped to um, kind of lead really uh, strong environmental reform than democracies is one that is on a lot of um, people's minds as as democracies around the world are, are struggling. Um, and I think that, you know, on the one hand, the Chinese have it right that governance needs to be central. And I think we, we will have a lot more clarity about actions and specific, um, you know, steps that will be taken in the coming weeks once the 14th five-year plan is out. But what we do know is that governance and strengthening of central power will continue. Um, we also know that the 2030 and 2060 targets will drive both environmental policies going forward and those of en en energy and industry and economics. Um, and I think, you know, the specifics of well, what those actions will look like and how we then engage on issues of going out the Belt and Road Initiative, China's investments overseas, and what the climate, the carbon footprint of those are, um, will become clearer when we see those targets. Um, and also, following the the 14th five year plan, that we'll also see in the coming months a rollout of specific sectoral five year plans on hydropower development, on energy, on you know different sectors. There, there those always follow the, the broader five-year plan. And, and we can expect most many of those to come out before ahead of the CBD and climate COPs, which I think will give us a really strong signal about how China is going to show up in those meetings and those negotiations. I think we can also expect um, that China will um, continue this questioning of, about potential alternatives to, to GDP you know, the decision last year to not focus on setting a target for GDP is still up in the air, whether that will happen again this year. Um, but I think it's clear that we will see a continued focus on quality and not quantity. And I'll stop here. I know we're, it's a quick run. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sam, to you on, on the, the 14th five-year plan, this big year, what gives you hope? Is China going to construct or help construct an international agenda for us all? across CBD, COP, and also green economy transitions? Thanks. Um, yeah, I'll try and keep it brief. I mean, it's, a it's clearly a really huge year. Um, one that has, you know, the, the super year for nature, of course, was supposed to be 2020. It was derailed by the pandemic. And I think the pandemic offers us, you know, a, a frame through which to think about the green recovery as well, you know, because it was such a vivid demonstration of how fragmentation uh, across systems and between nations and particularly the breakdown of international cooperation can you know severely derail our, our, um, our ability to overcome global problems that are, are, are such a central part of kind of globalized systems and similarly it gives us some hope for you know how particularly um, a, a particular role for the state and for leadership in the sort of harnessing of technological innovation can be very powerful when when we need it, and you know we've seen that in the accelerated rollout of vaccine development and so on. That you know how incredibly important that is, and and how widely that can be supported. Um, and I think you know we can learn some lessons from you know the ways in which 
we sort of need to, to, to act in a coordinated way across, across systems. This year, of course, that's going to mean acting across the, um, the, the COP26, which of course is hosted by the UK and Italy, um, themselves host of the G20 and G7 this year. Uh, then we've got um, CBD COP15 in Kunming, uh, it was supposed to be in October last year, then it was going to be in May this year. It's now looking more likely that it might be towards the end of this year. That gives um, the, you know, the possibility of finding interlinkages between the, the COP15 and the COP26, particularly around the theme of nature-based solutions. This idea that through preserving nature, we can also help to, uh, to preserve carbon sinks, and that can be an important kind of uh, point of finding synergies rather than trade-offs between the nature and climate agendas. Of course, there's a strong link also to health, nutrition, and inclusive development that you can find um, around all these kind of SDG themes and around the, the green recovery. Um, and I think that's going to link very um, importantly to the work that, that colleagues like Yunnan are doing around, uh, around debt and, uh, and, and development challenges uh, in, in the um, developing world. I think there's going to be a very strong demand from developing world countries for uh, for the rich countries to get uh, to, to make good on their promises around climate finance this year. Again, that is really cast in a new perspective for me by, uh, by COVID when we see the enormous spending that that country has been able to, um, uh, to, to exercise very quickly in order to re-stimulate their economies. The you know, 100 billion that, that poor countries are asking for at the um, at, uh, at the climate talk suddenly kind of pales in um, uh, uh, insignificance compared to the sort of spending that uh, governments have been able to find to, to, to bail out their industries. So I, I do think that this offers us a kind of a moment for a rethink in going into a potential new super year. The 14th five-year plan clearly can be part of that. We will know the numbers, some of the top headline numbers by Friday, I think. That's, that's likely when at the National People's Congress, Premier Li Keqiang will give his uh, sort of top headline targets. That will include a uh, presumably a growth target, although as Lila says, maybe that's sort of been downgraded a bit. I think there will be probably a headline growth target. There'll be a carbon intensity target, uh, which is of course, you know, um, uh, carbon dioxide per unit of economic output. There'll be an energy intensity target. There might even be for the first time an overall carbon emissions cap, uh, which would be a very significant kind of move. Um, and then from there, we'll see fleshed out the, you know, the, the big kind of uh, themes over the next six months or so around power and uh, air pollution, uh, some of the other sort of big, um, uh, big things that matter in terms of the economy. We already know some of the big themes. We know that it's going to look at um, so-called new infrastructure, so-called sort of new patterns of industrialization around things like EVs, um, you know, electric mobility, um, AI, big data, 5G, all of those, uh, that moving up the value chain. And, you know, it's, uh, to, to wrap up quickly, I think, you know, when we think about the kinds of moves that have happened so far and have been so transformative in terms of China's climate policy, most of them really align with that economic agenda. That is to say, um, moving towards slower, higher quality growth, moving up the value chain away from energy intensive, carbon intensive polluting production towards innovation and services. Um, achieving uh, technology leadership and, and um, uh, particularly becoming the leading exporter of clean technologies to the rest of the world and creating markets for those technologies, um, as well as the link between that and, as uh, I think it was um, Andy Norton mentioned, uh, kind of the link between that and, and legitimacy, particularly being seen to act on issues of public concern, and that prominently includes air pollution and, and other forms of, of local pollution. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Very comprehensive answer. Look, I'm going to come back to the, the question of debt and money to you now in a second. So warming that one up for you now. But um, come to Andy first. Um, really, the, the sense of the prospects of international adoption of eco-civilization. A question from James um, from our, our audience. And, and the sense of, of, you know, the international diplomacy angle of US, EU and China. China's putting this this concept out there as a narrative of its own renewal. And what is the sense that this is that, that policy will be successful? I, yeah, I mean, I, I don't see ecological civilization um, becoming a dominant framing for actors like the US and the EU. Um, obviously, the Europe has taken a Green Deal framing um, largely from 
I guess, US discourse. Um, and the kind of narratives and content of the Green Deal proposal, obviously, underpin a lot of what's, um, what's cooking in the US. Um, I mean, Sam's given an incredibly um, good and comprehensive overview. So, I mean, just to pick out a couple of things, um, one thing is, in terms of the geopolitical context, I can't think of a time when the major blocs have had so much to do internally, domestic agendas that are so incredibly challenging. I mean, if you look at what the Biden administration will have to do, um, it's getting it, trying to get the, the pandemic stimulus through now, then it will look for extra trillions on um, green transformation. Um, huge challenges in terms of getting that through, obviously, a very tightly um, uh, poised kind of Senate in particular. So, um, yes, the international agenda will be really important, and the Biden administration's put out the signals on that with Kerry and with others, um, but they will have an amazing amount to do uh, domestically, as will the EU. So um, that kind of, I think, creates opportunities for China to be influential if it takes um, these narratives forward. It's still not entirely clear to me how far that's going to happen. And just a final thought, I mean, this again echoes stuff that Sam was saying, but the geopolitical context has a number of elements. One is who's going to lead on pandemic recovery as pandemic recovery, right? Leave aside the green bit. And how is that going to play out? Um, debt, in particular, China's position, um, holding uh, more bilateral debt than any of the countries, very um, critical there. Um, also, the elements of vaccines and the sort of vaccine diplomacy that will roll out over the coming year will also have huge um, geopolitical ramifications. And then, as others have mentioned, um, the kind of competition for markets in green technology, green kit, consumer kit, and so on. So it's, um, I think it's a really complex overall framing and one where domestic challenges and this kind of broader geopolitical um, context will set the framework within, um, within which certainly the CBD rolls forward and to an extent COP26 as well. So it's hard to say how that will come out um, and how, how it will emerge. I mean, it feels obviously like an area where um, the international agenda for green transformation is very competitive. Um, so how that fits in with the big international conferences will be really interesting to see unfold. Just a final thing is that so far, I think the Chinese agenda on CBD is much less clear than it is on um, climate mitigation and the various agendas around that. I was really encouraged to hear from Sam a sense that, that there is something yet to come in that space, um, which would be great to see. I think everyone is anticipating COP15 to be um, October at the earliest. So the, the space for development there is a really interesting one. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. So you know now warned, um, warned about the, the money piece. We we hear Andy say that the China owns more of the COVID debt than than others, and this sense that Sam brought up that we developing countries wanted 100 billion for climate action, and oh, it's way too much, and all of a sudden trillions are are, are swilling through the world's from magic money trees from wherever and. But I mean, there is a genuine sense that at some point you have to pay this money back, and you, you know, what what conditionality does it come with, and and um, are we going to have to spend it again, all over again, when we when we uh, if we don't get this stimulus right, and we then have to put, pump it back into the system to get the green recovery on track, and an extraordinary sense of um, of where is the money what conditionality does it does it have a conditionality is it supporting green recovery show me the money show me where it's directing and show me how it's going to be spent and uh, and china's role in all of that um extraordinarily powerful and extraordinarily important your thoughts on on that um so i think you touch on on several 
uh, interesting issues there. I mean, one, one major kind of elephant in the room is this question of developing country debt and just how outsized a role China plays in that. Um, and, and yes, it's, it's going to be a major uh, problem for, for public financial systems and for governments in developing countries for years to come. Um, <laughs> on top of the sort of health and economic impacts of the of the pandemic um, on debt, you know, it's a it's a very difficult question for China. On the one hand, it's been, you know, again trying to demonstrate uh, its its responsibility and trying to participate in, in sort of global governance systems around debt through the the debt debt service suspension initiative and now the the G twenty Common Framework. And it is the biggest uh, participant in that common framework agenda for a restructuring and renegotiating um, bilateral debt to developing countries. But the problem with a lot of this Chinese debt is that it is, it is from commercial entities. It's from uh, a lot of these are commercial loans. They're not easily forgiven um, and they're not easily restructured. And we've yet to see uh, in terms of Chinese policy signals, whether they have a sort of long-term approach on how to deal with, uh, with the, the sort of struggling ability of developing countries to pay back this debt, other than the current status quo, which is to just kind of keep kicking the can down the road and suspending repayments and, uh, and suspending service. I mean, one sort of instrument that's been proposed uh, and, and interestingly, Ecuador has had been trying to push this with China is to use uh, debt swaps. So, so debt for nature or debt for climate swaps where a portion of debt can be forgiven in return for um, you know, uh, preservation of biodiversity or uh, pledges for, for financing to, to renewable energy or to clean tech sectors. And this is an area where potentially you know, China's renewable energy role uh, or China's role in financing renewable energy could be a, a sort of a win-win solution there. Um, but I think broadly, you know, we, we haven't seen very much overlap in, in that Venn diagram between, between China's sort of uh, climate role and, and this, this, this problem of debt. Um, I think what's clear in the future is that China is paying a lot more attention to, to this question of, of what it's financing. Um, and that will also include you know, more attention to the to the ecological ramifications of the projects that it's financing, and probably to ramp up more investment in uh, in, in renewable and clean energy, uh, which will include a huge um, increase in, in probably hydropower finance, uh, and and in this other area of, of you know developing its own renewable energy sectors. Um, but yeah, there's, there's yet to be a really meaningful interlinkage between these two issues. Um, and this is an area which I think you know, developing countries do need a greater capacity to, to push and to negotiate with China on. And uh, there is also potential, I think, for, for greater trilateral cooperation and, uh, and, and for EU-China cooperation um, to, to work with developing countries and build up uh, their, their clean energy sectors um, to have a green economic recovery uh, as well as Thank hopefully you. resolving that problem. Thank you, Yunnan. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're getting um, relatively close to uh, close of this. So I'd, I'd like to try and bring, give Lila a bit of a, a bit of a final word. Um, Laila, the things that really resonate from the work you've done with me and also what everyone else has said. You know, Andy said there is a great deal of work to be done um, to sort of walk the talk nationally. I mean, and that's, that's similarly for the EU, similarly for the US, similarly for China. Then there's this sort of international agreement or potential, and I'm not sure whether I mind whether or not something's a discourse or what we label things as long as the intention is there of reducing carbon and looking after nature and making our economic transition more sustainable um, as quickly as possible um, the links into cbd the the, the nature um, summit and the, the climate summit and 
how those will be in moments to accelerate. Um, what, what, what's, what Sam said that's really stuck with me is this sense of um, China needing stability, needing security, needing legislative responsibility, that, that sense of stability, you know, um, it's priority for, for China and whether or not it could, can achieve stability nationally unless it helps achieve stability globally and that confidence to step into a global agenda and be a constructor of international transitions or an accelerant from transitions over and above its own national priorities. Those are what I'm struggling with. And so I'm still slightly struggling, but I think I'm further along down the line. Um, support, engage, um, challenge your conclusions on that for the GC and um, what we what we should do next on our journey of understanding. All right, there's a lot there. Thank you, Oliver, and thank you everyone for a really lively discussion that we can only skim the surface of, unfortunately, in this time. But um, I guess to answer your question from, from back to start, um, what we should do next is um, there's a lot of uh, kind of percolating up in the questions. I think this looking to China, you know, pinning our hopes on China because we're really struggling. <laughs> you know, the geopolitical challenges are, are really um, severe this year and, and around the world. And there's this sense of, oh, could we, can we look to China? But we're also a little bit scared about what that means. And um, I want to just flag that as a next step within the GEC, we plan to sort of look at that question head on uh, the international piece. So this paper was very much about, let's understand eco-civilization within the Chinese context. Let, let's get really clear that this is about priorities of stability within China, of legitimacy of rule, of security, as we've, as we've, as we've discussed. And as a next step, we are going to be tackling head on some of the questions that have come up in the Q&A around, you know, to what degree is this, can it even be a narrative that is uh, internationalized? What it look like? Let's look more about green BRI. I would just flag for some of those questions, um, looking at Tyler Harlan's um, paper last year that specifically looked at exam and steps that are being taken. Um, it's, a, it's a really good piece of research, but we will also continue to discuss that. And I think um, for me that the takeaways in this question of, you know, can we even pin hopes on China? Should, should we be in, in looking at ecological civilization and the, the challenges this year and the decisions that need to be made as a global community is that the question of governance is really key. Does China have the answer as an authoritarian um, approach, I have big questions about that. I think um, there are really real concerns about using authoritarian means to reach environmental ends. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we have to not get too rosy eyed <laughs> about, okay. about that. Um, and then I would say there are there are some specific tools that we can look at from China's experience in implementing some of the policies that that will have transferability overseas. So, thank sorry you, Lila. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to our panel, um, Sam, Yunan, Andy, Lila. Thank you very much. It's been a fascinating journey of discovery of China, and I think you achieved what you set out to achieve, Lila. We've. We've now become um, much more knowledgeable about China, much more empathetic to its own internal challenges, and therefore what we can expect of it on the global stage. And I think that's really very, very valuable. And we will address the next question of, of what does that mean for the international, more explicitly in, in the nature and the, and the climate negotiations and discussions, and what that means for European policymakers or American policymakers and what that means for Green Economy Coalition and, and colleagues as well. So um, we're very grateful for all of you today. We signal the report, it's out now. Please have a look 
um, but also keep let's keep this discussion going. China is China matters, and uh, that's really critical for us all. Thank you, all of you. Thank you, IID, for hosting us, GC, and participants. I'm sorry if we didn't get to all of your questions, but have a lovely day and uh, hope you follow up on the report. Thank you. Bye bye.